Kristen Hardy, and I'm the owner of Sweet Birch Herbals, and it's a fairly new business. I just started it about a year or two ago, and I studied herbal medicine for about eight years under a master herbalist in Montague, Massachusetts, named Chris Morano of Clear Path Herbals, and another herbalist named Jade Alejandro Mace, who taught me a lot about product making. And so I do a combination of product making and uh, private consultations and classes. And this is one of my favorite topics, inflammation, because there's so many different angles to go about it. And I love to teach people projects and ways to treat themselves herbally uh, with really safe herbs that are very soothing and calming and simple simple recipes that are sometimes simpler than cooking, such as making um, nourishing infusion teas, which is something we'll, I'll show you today. Um, a little bit about my background is I grew up in Northampton, and I worked on farms for about five years after, during and after college. I went to UMass and studied sustainable agriculture. And I also dabbled in herbal medicine, and it wasn't until after I left college, while I was working on farms, that I had a lot of chronic back pain and digestive issues happening because I was under a lot of stress. And so I saw a friend of mine out who was an herbalist. She was my age, and she'd been studying with the same teacher. And so she became my herbalist. And within probably a few months to years, like all of the issues had been resolved and a little bit of changing my diet and uh, learning about herbs and doing different teas and tinctures. So I'm a huge believer in herbal medicine. Uh, I pride myself to be part of an herbal community that has amazing teachers. And a lot of my recipes fr come from Rosemary Gladstar, whose book I brought back there. And um, she's a strong believer in sharing the recipes and the abundance that's around us and accessing the incredible medicinal and healing properties that are available to us from plants. Um, and so I see myself as kind of a, like a facilitator between the plants and people, which is a gift. It's, a, it's really humbling to be in that position, to uh, be open to receiving information and wisdom from the plant world about how to integrate and bring this medicine to people. And so I'm a community herbalist. I do a little bit of clinical work as well, but mostly I'm wanting to bring recipes and, um, and this information to, to my community. So we're going to focus on inflammation today. I uh, put together a slideshow <laughs> in like a couple hours yesterday because I didn't <laughs> intend on being here until two days ago when the other um, presenter could no longer ma make it. So. Uh, it's a little bit, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm used to just doing like hooking and demos and things, so we'll do a little bit of that as well. Um, so let's start with what, what is inflammation, really? It's, it's a response. It's a response to something coming in externally or maybe something internally happening. And sometimes it's a really good response. You know, our bodies are saying, look, there's something coming into my barrier, my zone, and I want to either get, it, get rid of it or fight it or I'm responding. So it's a, it can be a really good thing. Like I, you know, I got a tick bite the other day and it got inflamed and red and I just thought, you know, my body's reacting. You know, it's doing its job. It's bringing blood there. It's moving the energy. And my response was, I'll, I'll put plantain on it because I know that plantain is cooling and anti-inflammatory and it's all over the place. So. Um, so the inflammation, it tends to be hot, you know, because the tissues are irritated um, and there's a blockage. So in Chinese medicine, we talk about stagnation or stuck energy. So we see our bodies as um, masses with bones and muscles and skin. That's like mass. And then inside of all of us, we have an organ, or all these organ systems. And they want to be working really smoothly and efficiently uh, with energy and chi, chi is energy, just flowing through them really eloquently and harmoniously. And sometimes we get stagnation uh, and stuck blood, 
So when blood is no longer moving, you know, there's that, like, there's a block. And so in Chinese medicine, it's about moving the blood through stuck places, like in joints especially, because you have, like, a 90 degree angle. So that's a lot of times where stagnation happens is in the knees and the elbows and the wrists and the neck. Um, and so it's about bringing, using herbs to move the, the blood, move that energy through. And then there's also um, inflammation from, because the immune system is responding to allergens, whether it's food allergens, whether it's uh, pollen and dander. So these aren't necessarily you know, bad responses to be having. The immune system's trying to do its job. But with allergies and things like that, it's a little bit too much, and the immune system becomes hyperactive. So there's incredible herbs, especially in the medicinal mushroom family, like reishi and shiitake and maitake, that modulate the immune system and bring it back to homeostasis. And it's like, you know what? <coughs> Thanks, immune system. You're doing your job, but this cat's probably not going to kill me with its dander. <laughs> or like pollen happens every year. So, you know, I'm probably not going to die from breathing in a little bit of pollen. Um, and a lot of times it's good to pr do prevention for allergens coming in, like a few months before allergy season, to prepare the body. And, um, of course, doing acupuncture is also really helpful because acupuncture is about moving, moving chi, moving blood. And then, um, and then there's the the blocked emotions, which um, the doctor talked about this morning a little bit, how stagnation can also happen with our emotions. And when we are not moving emotions, things can get stuck, and that could be causing depression or anxiety, um, even can become um, physiological in our bodies. Like, I think a lot of times for women, especially, there's PMS and menstrual cramps and headaches and things related to our our mental, you know, emotional nervous system and our, you know, our bodies, our physical system. So they're all connected, they're all whole, they're all together. Um, nothing is separate uh, in holistic medicine. Everything is part of a much larger whole. And um, my job is to kind of bring that, that perspective together that, that, um, that herbs understand that, that herbs are intelligent and they know where to go in our bodies and which channels to go through, whether it's the liver channels or the kidney channels or the nervous system. So um, does anybody have any questions about that so far? Just let me know if you do. OK. Um, so I want to talk also a little bit about um, the, li the liver. So in Chinese medicine, we have and in Western medicine, all these organ systems. And they're a little bit different in Chinese medicine and what they do. So the liver in Western medicine is uh, the blood cleanser. And so all of the blood that's circulating around us to our heart is getting cleaned in the liver, doing all this detoxing. Also, liver does like about 500 things, but <laughs> some of which are detoxing and um, purifying the blood. So when we eat, inflammatory foods or excessively fatty foods or high sugar, processed sugar and um, carbohydrates, the liver's job gets harder and there's more stagnation and more work and then the gallbladder has to produce extra bile to break down fattier things. So over time, that just becomes a lot for one organ you know, to be processing and that's an important organ and so a lot of the herbs that I work with are liver tonifying, liver cleansing herbs. Because if the liver's having a hard time, then the rest of the body, the blood, which is going through all the whole body, is also what's called in Chinese medicine, dirty blood. You know, it's not as pure. And, um, and then that can, and then that can, um, then when the blood is going through joints in different systems, there can be uh, different allergies, like the blood has, has like, um, chemical constituents that like will get dirty and then not want to move through the joints and that can create inflammation. So one of the best things to do to prevent inflammation is to have a really clean diet and that doesn't necessarily mean like eliminating all these foods and having a really strict diet. I'm all about eating what you what what you want to eat but everything in moderation and um, 
and staying away from really like industrial foods is what I call them. What really turned me on to all of this was reading Michael Pollan's book a few years ago, and that changed my entire like mental model of the world. Really, was like this is this is just disgusting that we're being fed foods that are killing us and creating inflammation. And so, um, if you haven't read anything by Michael Pollan, P O L L A N. Um, he really gets to the heart of disease in our culture and how it originates in our, our food system. And so, you know, joining a local CSA or um, getting your, your food or organically sourced, um, if possible, is really important. And staying away from carbs and sugars and things that you just can't read the ingredients of. Yeah? Can I just, carbs are an interesting issue. You're not saying all carbs. No. You know, and yeah, I'm talking mostly about like bread where you can't really read the ingredients and like things you would buy, fast food, um, but like whole grains of course are, are a different story. And also everybody's bodies are different um, and they change. Some weeks I can't metabolize bread at all, it makes me feel terrible. And then there's other parts of the year where like sourdough bread is like the main thing that I want to eat. So we're constantly evolving and changing, and I think that it's to go to like if you have inflammation, it's good to to experiment and eliminate things that are inflammatory causing, such as you know refined carbs and sugars and um, and pasteurized dairy is a big one. We're not really designed to eat pasteurized dairy in excessive amounts. We do it because of the you know the health system and being that we can't distribute raw milk, but you can get raw cheese as well. Yeah. Raw milk. What was the question? Everybody's different. Um, I think that if you're going to drink milk, raw milk is probably the way to go. Uh, we, there are ways to source it directly from farms, which is a gift around here in Massachusetts. Uh, we are in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. I went through Rhode Island, yeah. Uh, there's different laws in different states. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so eating like a really clean diet. And um, so sugar and alcohol, sugar, alcohol turns into sugar, basically. It is sugar. Those things create inflammation in the body. And so eliminating those maybe for like a couple weeks or a month and seeing if you feel like your joint pain goes away, headaches, um, anxiety, stress, like these foods are supposed to, like food is supposed to nourish us and sometimes if we're not getting that direct nourishment then other symptoms arise and inflammation is a symptom, you know, it has other causes but it's really like a symptom saying, like a signal of hey body, like hey person out there, there's something going on here and I'm not happy. Like, we need to make a change. So the other thing about um, managing and reducing inflammation is what we call moving our lymph, which is part of our immune system, which we can do by exercising, um, taking hot baths, doing yoga, any kind of movement, dance, whatever makes you happy that, like, gets your circulation going, sweating. You know, we're releasing toxins when we're moving our lymph system, our blood, our circulatory system. And then there's also really amazing herbs that uh, go along with that, such as, uh, I wrote them down, cleavers, red clover, nettles, rose, calendula, dandelion. These are all called alteratives. They're all blood cleansers and lymph movers. What? Uh, alterative, it's a means blood cleanser, and these are great because you can drink them every day, like in a tea. So I brought, um, I brought what's called a, to a tea tonic, and it's something you can drink every single day just for general nourishment and health. And it has, uh, I'm going to pass it around just for you to see it. it. Has tulsi, which is holy basil, rose, mint, hibiscus, and nettles. Um, you can like open it and smell it. So I, I love these because they taste good. You can make a huge batch of them for in a, in a half gallon jar and then refrigerate it for a few days and just keep either reheating it or drinking it cool um, in the summer. And the thing with 
these kind of teas is they're called like a nourishing infusion, which I put a, a recipe on the back of the, the other side of the handout and a list of different herbs that you can use. And these are herbs that you can either buy at a, in a bulk store, like a co-op or Whole Foods or um, better like an apothecary if, some, if there's a place available around here. Or you can find them yourself. They grow, they grow in your garden most likely if you have a garden and they tend to come up around this time of year, which is a time to cleanse the liver and detox in the spring. Um, one of which is cleave, uh, chickweed, which I brought a little basket of. Look at me, I'm not even using the PowerPoint. <laughs> you can probably go to the next slide. <laughs> I'm not used to it, I forgot it was there. Oh yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, eating a clean diet. <laughs> I'm going to pass that around too. So that's chickweed. Yeah, so you can stop there is good. Yeah, great. Um, so this is a little basket of chickweed, which grew in, it was a, in a greenhouse, so it was really big and, and like delicious looking and kind of tender. And I was going to make an oil out of it actually because not only is it good to eat and put into salads, but you can infuse it with a little grapeseed oil for about four weeks and then strain out the, the, the plant material and make a salve or just put it on topically. And it's really great for cooling rashes or like hot skin irritations, eczema, burns, sunburns and those kind of things. Um, <laughs> Excited. <laughs> That's the chickweed, yeah. It just grows. It's like a, it just invites itself into most gardens. Um, so you don't even really have to cultivate it. <laughs> yeah, it makes itself home wherever it can. And so sometimes I'll just weed around the chickweed. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I think is really cool about herbs is that they, they show up. Like if we need something, they're just available. And some of them that we'll talk about, you'll see that some of the like really invasive plants in this country are actually really necessary for, um, for certain diseases. Yeah? What is cleavers? Cleavers, it looks kind of, it's in the bed straw family. It grows in like pastures and fields. Um, it has a whirl of like petals coming around the sides and it, cl it sticks to you. Like it's really like sticky, even to your hands, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing about moving blood is improving your circulation. So especially in the winter time when it's cold, taking a regular, like drinking regular tea of ginger, um, putting cinnamon onto your cereal or into smoothies. And it not only helps with digestion, but it warms and invigorates the blood. Um, and some, I put cayenne and ginger in a sore muscle rub because it improves circulation. It kind of brings the blood to the surface of the muscle. Um, so, and some of these like are different, are different body types. Like I feel like cayenne pepper is a little too hot for me personally. So I tend to eat more ginger and cinnamon. And I tend to not use cayenne pepper in tinctures because it's just so hot. Um, but ginger is really good in tinct tinctures are uh, alcohol and water and plant material, which we'll talk about. So let's go to the next slide. Since I'm on the slideshow track now. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about the liver. And um, there's different herbs that show up this time of year, like our friend of the dandelion that is everywhere. And the whole plant is edible. The whole plant is really medicinal. The flower is like somewhat medicinal. You can eat it. I just put it in fritters, which <coughs> kind of defeats the whole purpose, but it tastes good. <laughs> it's the only way I've found to use it other than like dandelion wine, which seems a little too labor intensive for me. Um, the root is especially good medicine for cleansing the blood. It's a liver tonic. Um, it's a bitter, so it stimulates digestion. And it, uh, it, it's an eliminator herb, so it actually is a, it eliminates things through your digestive system. It helps with that through the large intestine, and it also is a prebiotic, which is before a probiotic even. It like prepares the um, the intestinal tract with good inviting in good flora and, and into your digestion. 
Um, and then burdock and yellow dock are in this, a similar family. These are also really good blood cleansers and uh, liver, liver herbs, liver support. And these are things like burdock you could, you could take every day pretty much. It's just, it's such good um, food and medicine. So, and it's a root, which roots tend to be uh, nutritive, nutritious. Yellow dock is, it's more on the medicine side because it is very moving to the digestive system. So if you have, if you like already have a very, very regular digestive system, you might not want to take yellow dock. Um, and then Jamaican sarsaparilla, from Jamaica or somewhere far away, but it is an incredible liver cleanser and, and good for the skin. Yeah. In excess, yeah. Um, you know, if you have like for for burdock, like I don't I don't think that you could take it in excess. I mean, it's just such a nutritive herb. Like dandelion um, root. Dandelion yeah. root. The only contraindication with dandelion is if you have uh, already over excess hydrochloric acid in your stomach, mm -hmm. so you have heartburn. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't take that regularly. Yeah, and yellow dock, like I said, if you have a if you already have pretty like loose stools or like a regular digestive system, you don't really need it. Um, and Jamaican sarsaparilla is probably not great if you are pregnant because it's very moving and it's a really good for the skin. So if somebody has acne, um, it works right through the liver channel and clears out um, dirty blood and uh, just really cleans the system. I see it like I've, clients that I've given sarsaparilla to and their skin just clears up within like a couple of months, like pretty quickly. Oral, yeah. Yeah, so I do, all of these I pretty much do in tinctures, which are a combination of um, organic grain alcohol and distilled water and plant material. They're all in different ratios to whatever the plant is because they all, it's kind of, a, it's my more scientific side of me. <laughs> you know, everything else is like, yeah, more like intuitive. And it is intuitive, but it's also some things require like more alcohol and glycerin. So I'm going to pass this around as an example. And um, turmeric, I don't know if we should go there yet. I have so much to say about turmeric. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> So this is great because we were talking about like how to do this. So there's so many different ways to take herbs, which ones work for me. Like do I want to drink teas or do I want to take tinctures? Um, some tinctures you don't want to take every day, like maybe not the pain relief because those are pretty powerful. But there's some like <coughs> turmeric and Japanese knotweed that are great for inflammation, especially in the joints. Um, and then these daily tonic teas, which you can drink every day. And, um, and then there's things like mushrooms, which are adaptogens. So they, um, they, really mo they are immunomodulators and adaptogens, so they really um, balance the immune system. And they allow you to adapt to stressors coming in more um, fluidly, flexibly, kind of like, I think of it as they go along well with the immune system because in a way it's like if you have something coming in and you're, in, you're entering into fight or flight mode, the adaptogens kind of put up this little buffer and they're like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't need to enter into that mode. I can handle this. It's going to be okay. You know, it, it puts like a little buffer there. It's like I don't need to panic. I don't need to go in this fight or flight mode. My nervous system can, you know, handle this and I'm, I'm going to relax. So Rishi is a lot of times in my ADHD formula or a, on a focusing formula. Um, it's also really great for autoimmune disorders, um, especially Crohn's and, um, and the other ones, maitake and shiitake have different uses as well. Shiitake, you can you know, eat it. It's a mushroom and people cultivate them around here. And uh, they're delicious if you like mushrooms. So you can get the medicine from the food. And astragalus is another adaptogen, which is not a mushroom, but it's a root. And it takes about three years to cultivate, so I don't have any fresh yet, because <laughs> it takes a little while, it's precious medicine. But it, um, it's, it's great for the immune system, especially, 
I put it into all of um, my Lyme treatment formulas and Lyme prevention formulas because it boosts the immune system to kind of keep the spirochetes at bay. So spirochetes love immune systems that are, that are weak and they're gonna go after you know, people with, with weakened immune systems. So stragulus is really good for bumping up the immune system. And, um, and then at the bottom, the colonsonia and solenseal are like more lubricating, moistening to the joints and the connective tissue, like actually repairing connective tissue in the joints. Um, I made a solenseal tincture last week and it's like the most delicate experience because they grow so sporadically and there's not a lot of them and so I have to be like really careful about where I take them from and how many and kind of checking in with the environment around me because there's a way in which you can over harvest these wild plants um, and then the, the, you use the root and it actually looks, the root looks like a finger you know it has these little nodules kind of like these joints on the root and that's just fascinating. And it's like a kind of a, a, like a pale, you know, like whitish, pinkish color. And then you make a tincture with it, and it was like goopy, like very, um, like almost like how I would imagine joint fluid to, to look like if you could see joint fluid. And so to me, that's an indicator like how, how medicinal this is, that the plant looks like joints and fingers, and it actually feels like joint fluid. And so taking something like that for... Um, arthritis or you know if, if you're getting older and you're just noticing your you got stiffness in the joints um, it's just it's amazing stuff okay we can do the next one does anybody have questions about that I have a yeah uh, could you explain whether or not it's a leaf or what part of the plant mm -hmm. you are using as you go through the list of sure plants? yeah Thank you. yeah so Solomon seal is the root yep Yep. Yeah. Could you explain what it takes to create a tincture? Sure. What ingredients would be involved? Yep. Um, that's like a whole class <laughs> in itself. But the basics of it is people have been doing this for like thousands of years, you know? Like how, how to preserve plant material. Um, is You can preserve it by drying it or, or tincturing it. Um, and making syrups, which don't last quite as long. Or, you know, in beer and wine. That's medicine, too. It can be. Um, and so tinctures are a combination of mostly it's like between 35 and 60 percent alcohol depending on the plant and then the rest of that is distilled water and then there's a certain amount of weight of plant material and if it's fresh plant material then it obviously is going to weigh more because it has water in it and if it's dried plant material it's going to weigh less, and you're going to do more of like one part, um, one part plant material to five parts liquid. <coughs> and fresh is usually one part plant material to two parts liquid because there's more water in the plant. So that's like the, the very brief. Um, you can like look online or you know look in books. Um, Rico Check is a really great book by Rico Check about making medicine. Uh, R I C H O. Uh, his last name is like C, Z, E, C, H, maybe? C, Z, E, C, H. I'm not sure if I'm spelling that right. Um, so, that's, those are the, you can go to the next slide, actually. So, some of these herbs overlap between skin and digestion um, and joints. Turmeric root is one of them. Turmeric root is all around, like, has anybody cooked with it or, you know, seen it growing even? Yeah. So that tincture is turmeric root. It's from a powder. But um, you can buy it fresh in grocery stores now. They have it. They ship it from, like, India or something. So it doesn't grow around here. There's one place that I know of that it grows, and it's a, a small farm in Amherst, Mass., and they grow fresh ginger and fresh turmeric. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very young plant. It doesn't have the like dried skin on the outside. And you don't have to peel it or anything. I'm not sure of the potency of the medicine as much as like something that's coming from India because it's a little bit younger. It's more of like, I think it has the, the medicinal properties, but um, 
it's more of like a food, you know. Yeah. What's the name of the farm? It's called Old Friends Farm. And I um, sometimes I make a tincture from their their turmeric, and it's delicious. And it's different than the powder, though. It's a little different. It's a little more nutritive than yeah. No, that's I think you just answered my question. I was going to ask if the, the same nutrients were yeah true with the powder, because I you know thought of powdery turmeric and I try to cook with it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, with the powder, so though, you always with turmeric in general, you want to warm the um, the plant material. So you want to cook with it, and um, you want to heat it in warm water, make a tea. Eating it raw, you don't get as many of the, uh, the benefits from, or even just like sprinkling it on your food doesn't really cut it. You want it to be like cooked in a curry or warmed in oil first with spices and other like onions and things. And I don't think you could overdo it with turmeric. You know, it's just, it's amazing medicine. People in India bathe in it for inflammation, they like literally have baths of turmeric and you end up orange. <laughs> but sometimes like if I have I had a rash and I'll put it on me and then forget about it that I put the turmeric on and then I wake up and like my sheets are all orange. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so it's really, it stains. Like it doesn't really get out of things, yeah. I wanted to ask because I've been told that turmeric you need to take in combination with pepper in your system. I've heard that too, yeah, Ayurvedically. Um, pepper is a really good digestive stimulant, and taking the two of them together are a great combination. You absorb it, you absorb sure it better. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm yeah. Not sure. Yeah. As in the green pepper or the black or the white pepper? Uh, I've just said black, like black, black ground, pepper. ground, so like fresh ground. Very dark in combination. Yeah. Yeah. A paste. Um, you could take the powder and maybe mix it with a little bit of water and even a little bit of oil, kind of let it absorb for a bit. And you probably want to warm it up, yeah, yeah, to kind of get the extraction process happening. Yeah, olive oil. Although olive oil, it gets um, has a lower burning temperature, so maybe something like coconut oil would be great because coconut oil is really cooling <laughs> to the skin. Um, yeah. I think that coconut oil, I wish that we could grow them around here because <laughs> it's one of those oils that is just so lubricating to our digestive system. It's cooling. Um, if you get a sunburn, like coconut oil and aloe, I make a cream that has coconut oil and aloe vera gel and rose water. It's just, just like after the sun, it's so amazing. It feels really good, cooling. Um, and. So turmeric is like one of the prime anti-inflammatories available. Uh, this is the powder. I can just pass it around. Yeah. And again, you look at the root, and do you see what I mean with like the joints and the and the fingers? You know, like the joints. It looks kind of like a, a finger. You know, <laughs> like the way that uh, Solomon seal looks like. And. Um, Turmeric is warming, and it's a bitter, so it stimulates digestion, and it it actually it strengthens the digestive tissue, and alleviates inflammation while also um, increasing peristalsis, which is like the process of the it's like the way the smooth muscle moves your food through your digestive tract. So if one's constipated or it isn't having you know regular bowel movements, then it um, it increases that amount of movement. Um, and if you have like boggy, slow, um, damp digestion, as they would say in Chinese medicine, which is basically if you have gas, like turmeric will um, will cut down on the gas and um, and move things through. It kind of warms and dries and tones the digestive system, and it it enhances the liver's functions, which we talked about the liver with detoxing. Um, and it helps with the secretion of bile from the gallbladder. You know, the, the liver is over, over here, and the gallbladder is kind of producing this bile that, to break down the food that comes through. Um, and then it's exceptional with arthritis, except for rheumatoid arthritis. Because with rheumatoid arthritis, you don't want to use super warming or hot herbs, because that will aggravate it. Um, so more with rheumatism, it's good. And you want to use, um, 
you want to, oh, so for the rheumatism, it's good to use any of the dried or fresh. And if you were going to use it for rheumatoid arthritis, you would want to use more of the fresh turmeric than, um, it's okay to like eat turmeric, you know, if you have rheumatoid arthritis. Because the difference between dried and fresh is that the dried turmeric, similar to dried ginger, is just really hot. Have you ever noticed like the difference between powdered ginger is just nothing like fresh ginger. It's like a different medicine entirely. It's really hot and spicy. And you know, ginger tea from fresh ginger, even the tea bags you buy in the store, yogi tea ginger, it's like too spicy for me. But you can make a fresh, you know, tea with them. There's a recipe on the back of like fresh ginger and turmeric, and that's just much more warming and less like heating, hot. Um, so it's also really good for female reproductive systems because it moves blood, it moves chi, it's an amenagogue, and if somebody's having um, like stagnation in, um, with menstrual issues, it, it really helps to move, uh, move the blood. And it also lowers cholesterol by doing that as well, moving. So that's, that's turmeric. It is mostly grown in India, uh, except for in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next one. Dandelion. So this is another, this is a local root. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, that, maybe it's in India too. So dandelion grows like, everywhere, I think all over the world too. And it, you can eat the greens in the spring before it's gone to flower. They're really good for um, digestion. It's a bitter, so it gets digestion moving. It's also the leaves are a diuretic, and so if somebody has um, edema and excess water in the body, taking dandelion leaf tea or eating the greens is amazing medicine for for like for edema, and it doesn't strip your body of potassium the way that a lot of the pharmaceuticals do, because it has like so much potassium in it. I, there's this chart of like how much nutrients is in dandelion leaf and dandelion root, and it, it like blows my mind like that we're not eating this. It's a little bitter, but um, there actually is dandelion greens in the stores. I've seen them lately, cultivated like really big ones. Um, Dandelion seed? Yeah, I saw that somebody was growing dandelion flats the other day, and I was like, you're growing dandelion? <laughs> but she was an herbalist, and she was like, it's just so much easier to harvest, after, you know, because otherwise you're like digging up the lawn, and it's like, it's just, the roots are small and straggly when they're like in the lawn usually, but if you cultivate it, they're much, you know, bigger and easier. But the other thing is, is that I think that harvesting in the wild, which I do mostly, is that, these, the roots are like a little bit more medicinally powerful because they're survivors. Like they've decided to grow in that spot, they seeded themselves, they, they're repairing the soil, um, they're a bioaccumulator, so they're really good for the soil. Like they're, they're like on a mission. Whereas when we cultivate them, it's a little bit more like, I don't know, they have like a good life, you know? <laughs> like you're weaving around them, they get watered, fertilizer, yeah. There are so many different Mm-hmm. Yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Yeah, and you can make them, um, I put the, the flowers in fritters or pancakes, like make a kind of a corn or um, a gluten-free batter and then just like drop, dip each, dip, dip each flower in there and then put that in the pan and fry it and like flip it and it's this little like dandelion flower fritter. <laughs> That's fun. Um, oh yeah, so dandelion leaf has, um, 338% of the vitamin A that we need, and 649% vitamin K, 39% of the iron we need. Like that's just, that's incredible. It's such a nutritive, it's, it's, not, it's one of those food and medicines. Um, it's also cooling, so a lot of bitters are really, they're cooling to our, our bodies if we have, um, headaches that are from, do you ever get headaches that feel like they just like 
kind of go up the back of your head, up, up the back, and then like down into the front right in here. That would be like a gallbladder headache because it's on the gallbladder meridian. And dandelion root is super good for cooling. That's like usually like liver gallbladder issue, just cooling that, that system um, and relieving, relieving those hot, hot headaches. A liver headache is what it's called. Um, also really good for eczema and psoriasis, like hot skin conditions. So, um, and it helps to the inulin to normalize uh, for people with um, pancreatic issues or diabetes. Um, it's really good for hypoglycemia and blood sugar crashes and swings. It's just like, kind of like brings you back to the middle, you know? Just like, um, So if somebody's having like sugar cravings too, I would put dandelion root into a formula because it, um, I think a lot of times we get cravings for things when we're lacking something. And I tend to go for chocolate. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm lacking something. I'll just eat a chocolate bar. Um, I might have done that this morning. And that's usually a sign that we're just lacking some micro mineral, like micronutrient, mineral, vitamin. And these kind of, these kind of medicines that are so loaded with them, like try, next time as an experiment, try making like taking dandelion in some form and see, or nettles, for instance, nettle leaf so packed with minerals, and they're like up this time of year. See if you like want sugar after drinking a nettle tea, you know? It's not it's like a yeah, nettle tea. It's, it's maybe a little honey too, I don't know. But they're so jam packed with minerals that I forget that I even like wanted that thing. So I'm actually gonna make the tea right now so that it can steep for a couple of minutes. So, this is like simpler than cooking. I do it usually at night, and then I let it steep overnight because it's good to get at least four to eight hours of, um, of steeping to really pull out all of the, the minerals. Um, and I do like, in this thing, I'd probably do like, I would just eyeball it, I don't know. i just throw it in there. I think that would probably be good. Like let it sit on the bottom. And you always want to use boiling water. This boiled not too long ago. Can you pick it up? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to put this safety spoon in. Has anybody ever seen that technique? My mom taught me. <laughs> I broke too many jars. <laughs> it's something like, it does something where it, it doesn't allow the jar to break. Conduction of heat. Yeah, thanks, Mom. <laughs> All right, so that was it. <laughs> like, that was pretty simple, right? And so then you just let it, you cover it and let it steep for, um, we're not gonna steep it for like four hours because we're not here that long. It's still delicious, but you could let it steep for overnight and get, like this has nettles in it too. So it would really like pull out the minerals through the water extraction over the course of like eight hours. And then in the morning, you just strain it and drink it throughout the day. And this has rose and tulsi, which is like super calming, relaxing, um, good for anxiety. Just feel good after drinking it. The petal, yeah. These are rose petals, yeah. Okay, anything else about dandelion? Oh, people use it as a, um, you can infuse the oil, infuse the dandelion flowers, you can infuse the flowers and make a, a breast oil because it moves lymph, it mo it's that lymph moving property. Um, so if people have lymph congestion in the breast um, and, or if it's a cancer prevention even, it's really good for that. For oil infusions, you can do either a hot one or a cold. I generally do cold because um, it, you let them sit in just like oil without heating it for about four weeks. But if you didn't have enough time, 
if you like really needed dandelion oil, you could heat it for um, maybe like a couple hours on really low heat and then kind of strain it out and yeah, you could do it that way. I think it's, it's, it extracts more over time to do a cold infused oil. Um, I typically use grapeseed because it has a higher heat, um, goes up to 475 degrees. I'm just sometimes forgetful and like will leave the pot on and then the olive oil has burned and smells rancid and like fried food and the fried food doesn't really make the best smelling oil, <laughs> like a salve. <laughs> so this is what I typically do is I just get, you know, organic grapeseed oil from Whole Foods or Trader Joe's even, ha even has it for like even less money. I don't know if it's organic though. Yeah, I, yeah, it's like a dollar more, but this is better, I think. Um, I tried infusing calendula flowers in coconut oil, but because it like got solidified, it, it didn't work out too well. It ended up like getting moldy and weird. Okay, next, yeah. It's, I think the tincture is such a small amount, like you're taking half a teaspoon to a teaspoon a day. I'm talking like excess alcohol, like, you know, drinking a few beers a day or even like one or two. Um, I think it's such a small amount. If somebody has like, you know, really acute liver condition, maybe not do alcohol. You can make a glycerin-based tincture. Sometimes I evaporate off the alcohol and then add glycerin as a preservative for people that um, don't drink alcohol at all or allergic or in recovery, and that's an option. Um, so yes, you can do it without alcohol, and it's if you're not don't have a problem taking it, it's such a small amount. Um, yeah. Do you think it extracts as well though? Not sure what that means. With glycerin? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that what I tend to do is make the alcohol tincture first and then I heat it up and um, not to like boiling the water off of it but to, to steaming off the alcohol and you can actually see the alcohol evaporating out of it as you're doing it and then it reduces to about half and you don't want to go below half because then you start boiling off the water and um, the plant medicine and then you get half the amount of what you had and then you add the glycerin and that creates glycerin. It's not 100% alcohol free, but it doesn't taste anything like alcohol. Um, yeah. Great. So marshmallow root is another um, really excellent, excellent herb out there. It, uh, it also grows wild, although I mostly get it cultivated. And it like you can chew on the root and you get this like slimy mucilaginous um, t texture or taste into your mouth and it's not the most appealing thing. So I t generally make tea with it. This is just like a little bit of bagged dried marshmallow root. Um, you can pass it around and it's, it's so cooling and um, anti-inflammatory for things like Crohn's, colitis, ulcerative colitis, reflux, GERD, it's heartburn, it's just like prime, like relieve the symptom, you know? It's not really getting to the root of what's going on per se, but it's giving you that relief. If you're having heartburn, if you're having a flare up of something, it's going after that and just like cooling the area. You can even use it in, um, for skin issues as well. You could put it right onto the skin, make a paste or a poultice. Um, so anything that has like itis at the end of it, which just means basically like heat, um, condition of heat, that would be a really great thing to think marshmallow root. Uh, so I'm not sure if there's anything else I want to say other than for skin, it's really great um, topically for psoriasis, eczema, um, burns, cuts, scrapes, and 
Um, you can you can like make a paste out of it, a poultice, and just put it directly on there. Uh, I I tend to make salves with everything because poultice is kind of like a one-time use, and then you discard the material. Whereas a salve, by infusing the oil into um, infusing the plant into the oil and then straining it out, you have adding the beeswax. It lasts like quite a bit longer. So I I haven't used marshmallow root in a salve yet, um, but it'd be worth trying. Uh, it's kind of like a, more of a hit medicine, like I have a burn, I'm going to like put marshmallow root on it. Or I, like having this flare up, I'm going to make a marshmallow root tea. You know, it's not the best like, to you're, like nourishing tonic because it's got an interesting texture, but if you had something come up that's hot, then go to marshmallow root. Any questions about marshmallow root? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a difference between a, a tea and a uh, decoction. Generally, if you have a root, like marshmallow root or um, dandelion root, burdock root, roots take a little bit of time to extract the medicine from, so you want to put it into a pot and simmer it, like boil it and then simmer it for uh, at least like 20 minutes, and that really pulls out the medicinal constituents. <coughs> Steeping it, you won't get as many. Steeping is more for like leaves and petals, like the upper half of the plant. And decocting is like more of the root and um, mushrooms, things that have like thicker cell membranes, thicker cell walls. You want to like break down that cell wall. It's a little bit more like cooking, you know. Um, a lot of times the best tool for that is a crock pot. So I'll just put what I want into it turn it on, let it sit for overnight, and then the next morning have a really strong decoction of um, these plants. So if tea is the way that you want to do things, it's a really, it's a good tool to have. I just had to give mine back to the friend that I borrowed it from and I was really sad. <laughs> okay, next one is the infamous Japanese knotweed. Has anybody seen this guy around? Or girl, it's all female. The plant is like, there's, there's all female plant on this uh, on this continent on this um at least in the states I don't know if there's any males out over here it's one giant plant that has spread through the roots the rhizomes taken over and a lot of people really don't like it because it spreads so fast and it grows like a foot a day they say <laughs> if you put like a time lapse camera on it you might actually like see this thing growing. If you notice, like these shoots were up maybe two weeks ago, and now they're like trees. Um, what are the leaves? Like? They're like kind of oval, uh, diamond-shaped, spade-shaped, um, and they grow along river sides. Rivers, just like where it's eroded, they kind of hold up the the earth. They're, they protect from erosion. Um, and so, as an herbalist, I wonder, like, okay, what? Why is this plant here, you know? It's, maybe it has a purpose, other than housing a lot of ticks. It might have a purpose. And so people have done a lot of research on the root in particular, and you can eat these shoots, like when they're eight inches or so tall. They're just like rhubarb. They have a sour flavor, just like rhubarb does. I think they're even more mild than rhubarb. They make really great cobblers and chutneys, and that's like a whole other class, like how to cook with wild food. Um, but the root is where the medicine really lies. It is some of the most powerful local medicine that we have around here. And um, it is extremely anti-inflammatory, not specifically for autoimmune inflammation of the joints, but um, specifically for treating Lyme disease, inflammation from, um, from Lyme. And it is a blood mover, so it dispels those blockages, those stagnations we were talking about. Um, in the joints, and the um, and it's anti-arthritic. Like the list could just go on and on and on. It is an immunomodulator. It is antibacterial. So the most incredible thing about this plant is that it like goes right after the spirochete of Lyme disease. It knows. It's like it has an affinity for that spirochete. So I take Japanese knotweed every day from like. March 1st all the way through the end of November when the ticks are around um, just as prevention and it seems to it makes me feel better <laughs> about being outside all day um, and if I get bit by a tick I feel like a little bit more 
like at ease, or if I do get bit, I take a little bit more that day. Um, How do you take it? Tincture. Yeah, the tea is like pretty bitter. Yeah, this one is mostly just tincture. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen it in stores actually. I've been making tinctures with it for the last few years, um, and I know there's other local herbalists that also use it. It's the root, which yeah. is basically like a rock. Yeah. It's so hard. It's, it's like bamboo. Yeah, it is really it's unpleasant. It's yeah. I always like have like a Japanese knotweed harvesting party because I can get as many people as possible together to like <laughs> <laughs> dig up this root. Um, it's a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. And it is very dark. Like um, the root is kind of like this dark orangey. It almost looks like um, the root of golden seal or. Um, barberry, the berberine. That it's a sign for me that like bright orangey, brown around the edges to me looks like antibacterial immediately. I think like okay, um, and it is. Um, it's excellent for burn treatment and low white blood cell count. So, for um, for fighting cancer, especially leukemia and intestinal or stomach cancer. Um, it is a pretty strong antibacterial, so it goes after things like staph and strep, salmonella. Um, and I probably wouldn't take like large doses every single day unless I was treating somebody with uh, a bacterial infection. A little bit every day is like a low dose. Uh, it can be a little bit too moving, so if somebody a woman is already like has a very regular menstrual cycle or maybe excessive bleeding, I probably would not prescribe Japanese knotweed in a large amount. Um, and it draws out really hot, that hot like inflammation, that acute, um, that acute like damage or tissue damage, it just draws it out. It's like very pulling to um, like upper respiratory hot dampness, it um, digestion that just feels hot and damp. So it's a premier, like one of the best out there for, for inflammation. Um, and it can be applied topically for insect bites, infection. So whenever I get bit by a tick, which I hope doesn't happen very much this year, although I already have one bite, I put Japanese knotweed tincture directly on it immediately because it's so strong antibacterial and I just want to let that tick know like that and bite know like I'm not messing around I'm not going to get Lyme um, and if I were doing a Japanese if I was doing a Lyme treatment protocol it would definitely be paired with like golden seal because that's a really strong um, antibacterial as well. Could you describe your recipe for the tincture of sure. Lyme? Yeah um, I believe that it is most, I think it's just 50% alcohol. I don't have it off the top of, actually, wait a minute. This might actually have it. Um, preparation. Yeah, so it would be one to 2.5 fresh. So like one part um, plant, two and a half part alcohol water. And then 50% alcohol. And the dosage is 15 to 30 drops, up to four times daily, depending on how acute the issue is. And if you were mixing it in a formula, you wouldn't want it to take up more than a ninth of the formula, a not one, one ninth of it. Yeah. How much what? Preventively, up to a ninth of a, of a formula bottle. So, a not, um, well, it depends on the size of your bottle. So if you have like a two ounce bottle, you would not want to fill that with more than a ninth of Japanese knotweed. A daily dose, um, 15 to 30 drops, yeah. Up, up to four times, yeah? I do, it's sort of on my website. That's a whole nother work in progress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do. I just you can just email me and then I'll just ship it to you. Yeah, that's way easier. <laughs> the summer doesn't allow for sitting in front of the computer. Okay, next, nice, yeah. Um, and how much? Where are we at the time? Okay.
Cool. <coughs> Great. So there's like so many other plants that I could talk about, but those are like the top, the top three or four right there. Um, And this is sort of towards the end of the presentation about um, more topical things. So Arnica oil, you've probably all heard of it, tried it, it's amazing. Uh, I wish we could grow the flower. I think we can grow the flowers here. I've seen it growing. I haven't had much opportunity or success to do it, but the, the flowers is what makes the medicine. So you would put the flowers in oil for about four weeks um, and then strain them out. And it's super anti-inflammatory, good for the muscles and the joints. And I put it into my sore muscle rub with these other warming, stimulating herbs. And I know, like, especially after working outside all day, my back hurts from that like old kind of farming um, chronic injury that gets recalled. I put on arnica oil and maybe take a hot bath and that's just like, I feel fine the next day. Um, and then these salves, I do a blend of calendula flowers. Have you heard of calendula? It's this like beautiful bright orange, like the color of your jacket, like such a bright color. And they are um, really soothing to the skin issues of like any itches or bites or sc scrapes. Um, and comfrey, which also is a, a common garden plant. It's a bio, a bio accumulator. It has like a really um, incredible roots that go down and kind of pull up the nutrition from the soil deep down. Really great for um, taking the leaves and composting them afterwards because they're so full of nutrition because they're like going down deep to pull it up really great for not only cuts and scrapes, but also like deeper tissue issues, like um, even down to like the bone in a way. Like I wouldn't, if I had a broken bone, I'd go to a doctor. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe after getting it set and fixed and everything and all the surgery, whatever that was required, putting like comfrey leaf dressed in the oil, just like dipping it in oil and maybe macerating it up a little bit and just soaking that and putting that over the broken bone will actually go in and like repair the tissue, the damaged tissue in there. Um, and then even maybe wrapping that with like some plastic and then putting a heating pad over it kind of warms up the oil. And it's like, even if you have um, like torn, anything torn, any torn muscle, um, low back pain, just like, Comfrey is really incredible, and there is controversy about taking it internally. I don't make anything to take internally with it. I'm just not there yet. I don't feel like getting into that, but um, externally, it's, it's incredible, incredible medicine. Plantain grows all over the place in our gardens, in our grass. This, I think it was yesterday, I had a, a bug bite, and it was just really bothering me, and I didn't want to deal with it, and so I just picked up plantain, and you can either chew on it or mash it up with a little water in your hands, and then just stick it on there, and it breaks, you have to break up the cell wall a little bit that doing that, and put that on the bug bite, cools it down, like, I didn't even remember that I had the bug bite after that, or a bee sting even, like, draws heat out, draws out that inflammation that's happening. Um, and... Then the creams, like for hot, hot skin conditions, or if you're in the sun afterwards, or um, just even chronic skin issues, like coconut, aloe vera, and rose water are super cooling to the skin. Um, really, like, it just feels luscious. Like after I, I made some yesterday, and you have to make it in a blender, because it has to like emulsify and stuff, and my, my like treat to myself afterwards is getting to rub it all over because <laughs> it's like really luscious stuff. I mean, it's just got such, such delicious things in it and it feels so good and so cooling. And especially since I feel like I run a little bit hotter, um, putting on coconut oil versus sesame oil, which like some people are really drawn to sesame oil in the Ayurvedic world in India. 
that is like, it makes me irritable. I just feel like I have to do all this stuff and I get antsy. It's just too warming for me. Um, so I'm a big fan of coconut. Any questions about topical skin rash? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a different thing because it's, a, it's more of the, a bacteria. So I would make a wash for that with golden seal um, and maybe barberry and um, kind of mi maybe like mix those in a, make a decoction of it, like a small amount, um, and then put that directly like on the face to wash it with like a uh, washcloth or something. Yeah. I would do it. I would do it like daily, at least once a day, to see if it, you know, until it kind of goes down. Yeah, so golden seal and barberry. Yeah. Make a decoction of it. Yeah, of the roots, or you could make um, a paste with the the powder, golden seal powder. Yeah, golden seal is expensive. <laughs> it's a very prized um, prized root out there, but. Incredible medicine, yeah. The arnica oil and um, for muscle spasms, I think that arnica and I would do a combination of like hot and cold, you know, like a hot heating pad and then some cold ice and hot and cold and just kind of like going back and forth between the two. People say like just ice things usually, but I think going back and forth really brings the, invigorates the blood and moves the blood there. Um, antispasmodic, you could also take things internally that are antispasmodics, like um, cramp quinine. bark. What? what is it? Quinine. Quinine. I don't, is that, I don't know that one. Quinine. Yeah, quinine. Oh, okay. Yeah, that yeah, that's an, that's antispasmodic. Um, cramp bark is another antispasmodic. Even um, like catnip is antispasmodic. Chamomile. Um, and then there's like you can get into the pain relief side of things like meadowsweet and willow. They all have psilocybin acid in it, and that's like what Tylenol basically came from. Um, Jamaican dogwood. Um, these are all like lower dose in particular times. You wouldn't want to take them every single day. Yeah. Are there any poisonous plants that we should be? Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are. poisonous mushrooms too. So I always say like don't eat anything if you're not 100% sure. Um, generally things growing in the garden that are weeds are not poisonous like but like go and experiment. <laughs> Just kind of if you know something is for sure edible um, then eat it but yeah yeah there's a really great book called Edible Wild Plants a Field Guide, Good. and um, it's a, a Peterson Field Guide. And also, like, the internet is kind of hit or miss. I wouldn't rely on the internet because sometimes I look up Latin names and, like, weird plants appear. So um, I'd say get a book is better or, <coughs> or a friend that really that knows, um, that can positively identify things. Yeah. Um, great. I think there's only like one. Yeah. What were the greens in the basket that you passed around? Those are chickweed. Um, so chickweed. I can do that quickly. Is yeah. So you can either do like a hot infusion where you would kind of simmer these down for a while. And this is chickweed, it's very cooling. We talked about it. Um, but I prefer to do cold infused um, oils because it, it's, less, <laughs> it's less energy intensive and I feel like it really pulls things out. 
and I don't like heating up the oil until I'm making the salve. So it's like, I mean, I might chop it up more, but I didn't bring any knives or scissors or anything. But like, it's so simple. <laughs> it's just like, there you go. You put it in, and the one thing with oils is that the plant still has water in it, so it's more likely to, um, to could grow mold if it's not covering, if the oil is not covering all of the plant. Because if the water, the plant's material is above um, the oil line, it'll, it could get moldy. That's why like sometimes what I'll do is um, set the plant out for a few hours, just in, not in the sun, but on the counter or um, maybe even like in a brown bag in a car, a hot car. And that kind of like dries out some of the, the moisture into, in the plant material. And then I would make the, the salve. It doesn't take away from it at all. It just kind of reduces your chance of getting mold. And it's sad. I mean, it happens to me. Like, it happens. <laughs> um, Do you wash the material before you um, make it? Generally, I don't. I try to pick it really clean because if you wash it, you're going to get it more wet. Um, but, like, yeah, this is, this is pretty clean. It was, like, growing up. And then when you strain it out, I always strain it through, like, a, a cheesecloth or something so it really gets the, the finer particles out. And that's, like, just, you don't want to stuff it down too, too much, but I just want to do it enough so that it's not, um, the oil doesn't go or go, the oil goes over it. It might not fill it. I might have to add more oil, but I only brought one for today. It's really easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, um, it has a higher heat tolerance than olive oil. I just my own experience is that I I like heated it up too much once and ruined a whole batch. Heat, so. but, you're not it. but you have to um, to add beeswax. So if you're gonna make if you were just gonna do this oil and and use it as like a massage oil or something without beeswax, making just infused oil, mm -hmm. olive oil would be great. But because I'll probably heat it up and then add beeswax, mm -hmm. I just don't trust myself to like. <laughs> To burn it again, and then it yeah, it just smelled like fried food. It wasn't a good skincare product. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you um, when you talk about something helping the blood circulate mm -hmm. the system, does that mean that it's becoming a blood thinner? Is it act? Are those things acting as blood thinners, or is there some other? There's a difference between like thinning the blood and moving the blood. Um, there are things that thin the blood. But not a, I don't I don't use a lot of herbs that like necessarily thin the blood, um, but more of like moving, invigorating. Um, ex they call it like exciting the blood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, I think that there might be one more slide. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Okay. And um, I think that the only other thing is that. I want to pass around the, the newsletter sign up if you, anybody wants to sign up. Um, I send out like recipes and updates maybe once a month <laughs> when I remember. <laughs> I'm not a big, I'm not a big like, I won't like send you a ton of emails or anything. Yeah. Where do you get the grain alcohol? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I order it through Farm Co. And they have, I think, a, a place in, they deliver it, actually. You have to um, get a permit, and you have to have a commercial location for it to be dropped off at. Um, so it's kind of a, it's an ordeal, but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. You buy it over the counter in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island? Yeah. Where, though? Where? Where? Uh, the larger liquor stores. Yeah, yeah. just pure grade. Yeah, alcohol. pure grade, 190 proof. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it's not like actually in Massachusetts they just passed a law that they can sell it over the counter. So like Liquors Forty Four has grain alcohol, but it's not organic. It's like I don't I don't know. I just I don't really want to use it. So um, they might have organic in Rhode Island, but because with grain alcohol it's like oftentimes.
corn based or um, wheat and things that are tend to be GMO products and so I try to, to stay away from those and get the, the organic ones yeah good question oh and um that was that and I am starting to do a do you know what community supported agriculture is so I'm doing community supported herbal medicine which is a similar concept except I'm not doing really any fresh uh, fresh herbs um, because I like just I just like turning them into products and so the the products that I'm distributing for the CSA are all tinctures and salves and teas and um, it includes it includes uh, custom, like it includes private, private consultations because what I was finding last year when I did more of an herbal CSA is that I didn't get to know any of the, the people that were in my share. And it was like not everybody needed allergy relief or um, pain relief or something. So it's customized and I meet with, the, with each share, per, share member for like a few times and really get to know them. and. Um, and I have a special going on until June 1st for that. So there's like information and stuff about it over there and some of the products over there that I make. And, um, and I put a friend's card over there named Karuna Rockwell. She, is, uh, she specializes in um, guiding and coaching women with autoimmune issues who want to view their illness as more of um, a path towards initiation into something else in their life, like a, as a gift. Where is she located? And she's located in Northampton, but she does it mostly on the phone. Uh, I don't know if she does many in-person things, but she's an incredible human being who's also gone through autoimmune issues and um, has found a way to see it as a, an initiation into mentoring and coaching other women through them. So I put her card over there. There's just one of them, so maybe you want to write down it. For information, so dang it, yeah. So that's it. I said, unless you have any other questions. Where are you located? I'm located in Northampton. My office is there, my farm is there, my whole life is there. But I wanted to come out here to kind of spread a little wider, yeah. What were some of your teachers again? Montague? Chris Morano in Montague. And he can be found at clearpathherbals.com. And Jade Alicandro, it's A-L-I-C-A-N-D-R-O, hyphenated M-A-C-E. And she's in Shootsbury, Mass. And she does a lot of teaching. She's a really excellent teacher. And um, she takes people out into the field and making all these medicines. So you end up at the end of her class having like your own apothecary by the end. So it's a really good really good class. Could yeah. you repeat your name? I'm sorry. Jade? You have it on the Do I have it? I have it on the yeah. handout, right? Resources. Yeah, so both of them are there. Jade and uh, Chris Morano. And the Peterson's Field Guide. Yeah. I, am I going to the Women's Herbal Conference? Where, when is that? Where is it? New Hampshire. What weekend? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. I'm Maybe. Cool. going to the symposium in oh, a yeah. few weeks, in a couple months. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you all, and thanks to the Marion Institute for having me.